Let me add uh, words of congratulations to um, NBR and the Wilson Center. Now that we're two-thirds of the way through th this assembly, it's clear to me that we are succeeding, that like, like you and I was part of the, and several others, part of the panel that uh, conceived of, of topics and thought about ways to increase the volume and the utility uh, of academic input into policy decision making in, in this town. And uh, this is clearly a very different kind of session than the standard academic conference by both the questions asked and the tenor of the discussion. So we're, we're off to a terrific start. And the two papers uh, presented here uh, this morning continue uh, that high quality and relevant contribution to decision making. They're very different papers, but they're not, uh, at least as I read them, sort of juxtaposed opposites. It's not sort of one view uh, contrasting with another. Uh, I think about them and heard them and read them more as different ways of cutting into a complex problem that one of the things that isn't quite clear is whether they're cutting into the same problem uh, in this. That, and a lot of it has to do with the framing of the issue to shape the analysis and the presentation. As, again, Taylor pointed out Mike, Ob Mike Lampton's observation that if one frames the question in zero-sum terms, that precludes a lot of uh, options for dealing with the situation. I, I would suggest that at the broadest level, the question we're concerned about in Northeast Asia or East Asia more generally is what threatens the peace and stability and prosperity and what should be done to address these threats. Uh, again, that could be tweaked in, in many ways. Um, both of these papers attempt to get at that. That Dan, uh, I would characterize as a, a, a realist approach that assumes, infers, or imputes uh, intentions and, and recommends a classic balance of pro, a power approach for dealing with them. It, it does much more than that, but that's a, a core element of it. That rising states. Uh, seek to displace dominant powers. That is sort of a starting point and puts the burden uh, on others to uh, make the case that China will behave differently than other rising powers. Uh, Taylor, more in the paper than in the um, compressed presentation, begins by looking at China's stated goals and looks for congruence or not between what China says it's trying to do and the way it's constructing its forces to say, uh, should we pay any attention to this uh, published uh, strategy and doctrinal body of, of literature, uh, or is that just a, a smokescreen? And uh, his conclusions are that they actually track pretty well, that uh, uh, if the Chinese intend to achieve the goals they proclaim, they're doing the kind of things that would be consistent um, with that. Dan correctly focuses on the multiplayer character of this game, that it's not the U.S. displacing, uh, the U.S. Uh, a, a danger of being displaced by China or China ascribing. It's China and the United States operating in a region in which uh, Japan, the Koreas, um, Russia, India, others uh, that are engaged in economic relationships have interests and objectives and relationships uh, that are multiple, cross-cutting, not always fully consistent. And uh, as Dan framed the question of w what would each of them fight for? Uh, with a two-part, at least, character. What would they fight to achieve, and what might they fight uh, to avoid or prevent from, from happening? That if one starts from the 
worst case kind of perspective that is um, quite appropriate for developing uh, force, uh, force structure, weapon system, tactics for dealing with them, that what have you really got to be prepared to deal with? If you worst case, then you can deal with anything that is less than that. Um, if one takes that and lays it on the Chinese considerations as, as Taylor uh, laid them out, uh, that leads you to a, a requirement for a very large, very varied, and highly technologically sophisticated Chinese military to do all of these things where the worst case is that they have to deal with the United States, that really drives towards a high-end military system that quite naturally is perceived by the United States and by other actors in the question as targeting American vulnerabilities. You say, why in the world would China invest money in a military capability that didn't focus on the United States and the most vulnerable aspects of American capability? To do anything else would be, at best, a waste of money. Uh, and if they deal with us, they presumably have dealt with other potential actors which have lesser capabilities. So we've got a danger inherent in this of uh, militaries doing what is appropriate for militaries to do that causes sort of action, reaction, uh, response, mirror, mirror imaging that we need to be aware of. And I, th I think Dan's sort of paper um, uh, sensitizes uh, the, the readers and other analysts to the need to, to do that. Sticking with, with Dan's paper, since the goal of the overall um, uh, assembly is to think in terms of policy terms, I, I think the policy implications of Dan's paper are clear but very different. Um, one is the getting at the uh, what's in the heads of the players, the what would they would he, he condensed down to what would they fight for, the need for this multi party multivariant assessment of objectives that requires a lot of work and, and sort of what Taylor laid out today is sort of a first cut at one place that, that indicates what's involved and that needs to be done for, for all of the players. The other one is, if I read it correctly, uh, uh, certainly I think a fair extrapolation is that the prudent course for the United States given the uncertainties about China's strategic intentions, is to assume that it wants to perhaps acquire the capability to challenge American hegemony in Northeast Asia and to prepare appropriately, uh, strengthening the alliances, assessing what the Allies would do, what they would contribute, uh, the nature of their own relationship with China, and so forth. But the implications is, end of the day, if this is aimed at China displacing the United States, the Americans better be prepared to pay the price to maintain a unilateral balancing capability. I mean, I think that's the logic of the argument in this. And uh, of, though it focuses on military, I don't think either of the panelists would disagree that the idea that we ought to think of this uh, as including uh, political, diplomatic, economic, cultural, all other uh, uh, arrows in the quiver to be brought to bear to address the balance of power, which isn't simply military power. Taylor doesn't take his analysis as, as far as Dan does toward the policy uh, implications of it. But I, I draw out two. Um, uh, one is a sort of a not-so-fast uh, rush to the worst case, that look carefully at uh, what the strategic situation is for China, I would say for all of the other actors in the region and what they're doing to deal with it how the rhetoric uh, conforms to uh, the observed actions, uh, but that there's a larger scope for politics and diplomacy 
there are more possibilities for uh, multilateral cooperation, collaboration, cross-cutting relationships that would address some of the underlying um, sources of concern to China and the other actors that, that uh, the military solution need not be the, the, the first preference. Uh, the other is to hedge. Since there are uncertainties, and clearly there are uncertainties about China and about the other actors, that we should hope for the best but prepare for other eventualities. Hedging ill prudent is problematic because what one does to hedge reinforces some of the impressions that one has about the United States, the purposes of its alliances, what China does uh, to hedge against um, uh, eventualities causes strategic planners and policymakers uh, to push a little further in the well. We got to hedge a little more. And particularly, it's become particularly problematic when it gets to the point of to be really effective against a really capable adversary, should it come to that, they actually have to prepare not for an all-purpose military conflict, but for a military conflict with a particular adversary with particular assumptions about uh, who will be allied with, uh, with us and with them. And that kind of specific focus underscores, capitalizes all of the signaling uh, that I referred to earlier in, in the capacity to uh, uh, action, reaction cycles, and mirror imaging. Shift from that to a couple of, of broader uh, contextual one, that, that the, the, the papers take what is now uh, probably the overwhelming uh, starting point of China as a, is China a problem, wherever it come out, but is China, is the rise of China a problem for stability and security in the region? It may not be the biggest threat to security in the near term. I mean, one can think of North Korea. Uh, acts of commission, like the sinking of the Chonan, uh, acts of collapse, a failing, flailing state uh, that, that uh, could destabilize without intending to do so, uh, ought to at least think about Japan, you know, not Japan as a resurgent militarist power, but there's a body of literature about waning powers. Uh, and states wanting to act before they lose more power and influence. And looking at Japan's willingness to rely on the U.S. extended deterrent uh, in the way that it has now for, for 60 years, that the, uh, the panel this morning, Dan Snyder's talk, cautioned us to, to, to think about this. Also, U.S. actions that Things that we do out there of a uh, normal force modernization as a prophylactic measure for the in case uh, as a hedging strategy, it's a classic case of we're so big uh, that we can be sure that the actions and the policy statements will be observed, will be considered, and if history is a guide, will be overanalyzed um, will be interpreted by the Chinese as more specifically directed against them than they, than they are likely to, in fact, be. But we need to look at all of the, the interactors, for all of them, and back to Dan, look at all of the, the actors, and ask, what is their hierarchy of the goals here, objectives? What is it that China, Japan, each of the Koreas, the United States out there, what do we want to achieve? Uh, how do those priorities differ? Where are they consonant? Where are they um, compatible? Where are they in conflict? Which way do the trend lines go on this? And how do any of these feed into decisions about what they might fight for or what me might fight for? Um, asking questions about, finally, the status quo. Status quo is something to be preserved or something to be changed. 
for those who want to preserve it, what do they think they need to do to make that happen? For those who want to change it, similarly, what do they think they knew, need to do? And how are they going about it? And how much of that is through methods short of war, short of military? Um, what kind of breakpoints are built in? We will try to do this through economic leverage. If we don't succeed, that we're not automatically going to ratchet up to military, or we are. I mean, those are the kind of things I think we need to look to. Final point is that Northeast Asia, in the experience of the Cold War, I think teaches us another lesson that requires some tension, and that is the uh, rise of new powers is not automatically destabilizing. That the, the recovery of Japan, uh, the rise of South Korea, that when this was part of the Cold War structure and they were on the free world camp led by the United States, the Americans, by and large, didn't view this as threatening. It strengthened the alliance as a whole, that the strengthening of any member of it was good for the whole, and we benefited from it. It was not thought of in zero-sum terms. Now there is no equivalent of the Soviet camp that at least in theory, of, up to a point, one might think of the whole world or the Northeast Asia region as similar to the free world. And can we work out arrangements that are explicitly not zero-sum, if we don't define them as zero-sum, that are seen by all of the players as enhancing individual as well as collective security and prosperity. I think we can do it, but on a way toward that end, the way toward that kind of analysis goes through what each Dan and Taylor have argued, I think persuasively, needs to be done. Good papers. <laughs>